Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I see that there are still some people trickling in, and that's fine. But uh, I think we will now proceed on to the uh, debate for the symposium. Uh, before uh, introducing uh, the moderator, though, I would like to uh, make a quick announcement about the surveys that are distributed. Um, they come in a before and after format, so please fill out the surveys as much as you can beforehand and then uh, wrap them up at the end. And then uh, you can turn them in uh, to people that will be waiting out outside after the debate. All right, the uh, title of the uh, debate is The Constitutionality of the Affordable Care Act. Now, when we uh, first conceived of the title, we were uh, considering uh, maybe using uh, Vice President uh, Biden's description of the Health Care Act, but uh, unfortunately, we, we do have a certain obscenity rule here. So, <laughs> um, It is my uh, pleasure, though, to introduce our moderator for the debate, uh, Ju Judge Sandra Akuda. Sandra Akuda is a judge of the United States uh, Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit and has been since 2006. Before becoming a U.S. Circuit judge, California Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger appointed her to be Deputy Secretary and General Counsel of the California Resources Agency. Prior to her political appointment, Judge Akuda was a partner at the Los Angeles office of O'Melveny and Myers. She previously served as a law clerk to U.S. Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor and Judge Alex Kaczynski of the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals of the, for the Ninth Circuit. She received her JD from the, United States, or from the University of California at Los Angeles School of Law and a Master of Science from Columbia University School of Journalism. She earned her undergraduate degree from the University of California at Berkeley. Nobody's perfect. <laughs> In addition to her duties as an active U.S. Circuit Judge, Judge Akuda is currently an appointed member of the Judicial Conference of the U.S. Advisory Committee on Bankruptcy Rules. But most interestingly, and this is something that the uh, panelists, uh, debaters, should keep in mind if, in case they run over, is that prior to her legal career, Judge Akuda took an unorthodox career path, which included serving as the first female editor-in-chief of a national martial arts magazine. Judge Akuda. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, I loved seeing in the bio that they wrote up that I had taken an unorthodox career path. I don't know if being the editor-in-chief of Inside Kung Fu counts as a career path, but it is an a, uh, honor to have, uh, to have had that role. I'm very happy to be back here at Stanford. I love being here, and so I'm, I'm delighted that the Federalist Society invited me to moderate this panel. Uh, I'm also very happy to be moderating this debate between two such influential academics and legal thinkers. Uh, they say that there's nothing so frustrating as arguing with someone who knows what they're talking about. And so I think we, we have uh, room for a lot of frustration in the panel today. Although neither of our panelists need an introduction, I've been asked to make one, so I'll be brief. First on my left is Professor Randy Barnett. He's the Carmack Waterhouse Professor of Legal Theory at the Georgetown University Law Center. Professor Barnett's writing is widely published and read. He's written over 100 articles and reviews, nine books, opinion pieces and publications like the Wall Street Journal, and is a frequent contributor to the Volokh Conspiracy, where I read him often. He was awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship in Constitutional Studies in 2008, but that wasn't his greatest accomplishment in 2008. In that year, he also portrayed an assistant prosecutor in the film Inalienable, which according to the movie database IMDB is a legal science fiction thriller. Uh, finally, I should note that Professor Barnett is an active constitutional advocate on the very issues we'll be debating today. In 2004, Professor Barnett argued the medical marijuana case of Gonzalez v. Raich before the Supreme Court. And he's now one of the lawyers representing the National Federation of Independent Business in their challenge to the Affordable Care Act. Our other debater is equally renowned. 
Uh, Professor Pam Carlin is the Kenneth and Harl Montgomery Professor of Public Interest Law at Stanford Law School, where she also co-directs the school's Supreme Court Litigation Clinic. She's published numerous articles, books, and textbooks, including a leading constitutional law textbook. She writes a bi-monthly column for the Boston Review on legal issues. Uh, and like Professor Barnett, she's also an accomplished Supreme Court advocate, having worked on more than 70 cases, including arguing seven before the court. And as many of you in the audience are doubtless aware, Professor Gar Carlin is also an inspiring teacher. She's won numerous teaching awards, and among other things, has been selected twice as commencement speaker by the graduating classes at Stanford. Professor Carlin is an elected member of the American Law Institute, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the American Academy of Appellate Lawyers. But unlike Professor Barnett, at least according to my research, uh, she hasn't been elected to a movie database yet. <laughs> so let me briefly set the stage before turning it over to Professors Barnett and Carlin. Congress passed the Affordable Care Act in March 2010. That 2,700 page legislation was controversial, uh, leading to some 30 lawsuits challenging the act, stirring an ongoing national conversation on the role of federal government, and more important, fully booking the FedSoc event calendar for the next three years. Uh, today, it's our turn to add to that illustrious and growing list of talks entitled The Constitutionality of the Affordable Care Act. And our debate today is especially timely because 10 days from now, uh, the last Supreme Court briefs in the case will be filed. And on March 26th through March 28th, for six hours, the court will hold its own debate on the constitutionality of the Affordable Care Act. But sadly, that debate won't be followed by a cocktail party. <laughs> the court will consider the constitutionality of two major provisions of the act, the individual mandate and the act's expansion of Medicaid. We'll be focusing today on the individual mandate, which requires most Americans to buy a minimum level of medical insurance, and if they do not, to pay a monetary penalty instead. Our discussion today will begin with two 10-minute open, opening statements, first from Professor Barnett and then from Professor Carlin. And that will be followed by five-minute rebuttals, after which we'll have question and answer session. So I'm going to lead off with a softball question. And while I'm asking that, you can line up at the two microphones and ask really hard ones. So let's get started. <laughs> Professor Barnett? Thank you, Judge, um, and thank you for, uh, to the Federal Society for having me here. I asked both uh, the judge and for Pam if, to, uh, to allow me one minute of time for a point of personal privilege, which would not count against my 10 minutes, uh, and that is to uh, thank, personally thank the, the Stanford Federalist Society for the role that it played in my becoming a constitutional law professor today. Uh, 25 years ago, uh, uh, the president of the Stanford Federalist Society, Brian Brilly, invited me to speak at the fifth National Student Symposium here at Stanford on the First Amendment and on a panel on freedom of association. I was a full-time, 100 percent dedicated contracts professor in those days with no interest, in fact, an anti-interest in ever becoming a constitutional law professor. Uh, and I was reluctant to accept this, but I was prevailed upon by the student who I knew. And, and I really wanted to go to a Federal Society event. I'd never been to a Federal Society event before. And so I went and I spoke. And uh, I was on a panel on freedom of association, which you may know is not actually mentioned in the Constitution. And so the, the, the punchline of my talk was about the Ninth Amendment. Um, and it got a much more favorable review from the Federal Society than I ever thought it would. And as a result of that, I decided, well, maybe I should find out something about the Ninth Amendment, because I really didn't know much about it. And then the Ninth Amendment led to other amendments and other provisions. And then eventually I became a constitutional law professor. So uh, ha had it not been for the Stanford Federalist Society, I think there's an excellent chance I would never have become a constitutional law professor. That was, they really got me into that world. 
Um, and I, I say this not only out of a sense of appreciation, because, but so that you realize the power that you can have on another person's life, even as a law student, you just never know when something you do uh, is going to redound to someone else's benefit and sort of change their life, which so, uh, as the Stanford Federalist Society, changed mine. So I just want to thank you for that. Uh, now, back, now you can, we can start the clock. Um, clock started. Okay. On March 26, the Supreme Court will begin hearing argument in the constitutional challenge to the Affordable Care Act brought by the Attorneys General of 26 states and my client, the National Federation of Independent Business, or the NFIB. Spread over thir three days, this will be the longest Supreme Court argument in nearly 50 years. The unprecedented length of time allocated to argument undermines the confident predictions of a multitude of law professors that the challenges to the Affordable Care Act were frivolous and that this would be an easy case for the court if it were ever to get to the court. Indeed, just last week, the court extended arguments from five and a half hours to six hours. That's a lot of time to devote to an easy case involving a frivolous constitutional claim. So I think regardless of how this case comes out, I think it's fair to say that this assessment by a bunch of experts on constitutional law and the Supreme Court has been refuted. It is not an easy case. My job today in just 10 minutes is to explain as succinctly as possible why the individual mandate is unconstitutional. And to stay within my time, I won't be discussing the separate issues of jurisdiction under the Anti-Injunction Act or the severability of the individual mandate from the rest of the Act. I'll be happy to talk about those issues in the Q&A. But rather than get into the, and rather than get into the weeds of particular cases and doctrines, in my opening remarks, I want to pull back and focus on the fundamentals driving this case. Over the past two years, I've attended the oral arguments in all the challenges uh, in the various courts of appeals, as well as the original trial court argument in the Florida case. And last September, I was there for the oral argument in the Sky 7 versus Holder case in the DC Circuit Court of Appeals. As you'll recall, in that case, the DC Circuit upheld the constitutionality of the individual mandate over a dissenting opinion by Judge Brett Kavanaugh, who contended that the Anti-Injunction Act deprived the court of jurisdiction to hear the case. During the argument, however, Judge Kavanaugh outlined a four-step analysis that neatly summarizes the constitutional problems with the individual mandate. And I should tell you that I wrote these comments out, I prepared these comments not knowing that Judge Kavanaugh was going to be here today, uh, but somewhat relieved that as what I actually did say about his opinion in the uh, DC case is favorable. So here is the, um, here is, uh, here is the four-part structure that he laid out in about 90 seconds uh, from the bench. And I, I was so moved by this, I actually reached for a, a piece of paper from the person sitting next to me and jotted these things down. And then this whole talk is organized around these four points. First, imposing an economic mandate on the people to enter into contractual, a contractual relationship with a private company for the rest of their lives is literally unprecedented. As Middle Pennsylvania District Court Judge Christopher Connor, the third district court judge to find the mandate unconstitutional, wrote in his opinion, quote, the Sixth Circuit and Eleventh Circuit decisions concur on one significant point. The Health Care Act has no equivalent in Commerce Clause jurisprudence. Quite simply, there is no factually similar precedent addressing the use of Congress's commerce power to enact an economic mandate of this magnitude. Thus, both decisions spotlight the individual mandate's voyage into uncharted territory of constitutional law. Whether the extension of power is logical or appropriate, the fact of the matter is that, co that Commerce Clause jurisprudence is bereft of authority clearly permitting the extension. That's Judge Connor. Of course, the fact that something has never been done before does not automatically mean that it's unconstitutional. But Judge Kavanaugh then observed that the unprecedented nature of the mandate does nevertheless raise an inference about, constitutional, uh, about constitutionality. Although judges should approach all acts of Congress with the presumption of constitutionality, he said, given that in 220 years, the Congress has never claimed the attractive power to mandate that private citizens send their money directly to private companies, judges should at least be, quote, hesitant, unquote, before endorsing such a power. This interpretive principle was invoked by Justice Scalia in his opinion for the court in Prince versus United States when he was evaluating the constitutionality of the power to commandeer state governments as a necessary and proper means of executing the commerce power. In Prince, Justice Scalia wrote that, quote, 
If earlier Congresses avoided use of this highly attractive power, we would have reason to believe that the power was thought not to exist, unquote. In the Affordable Care Act, Congress claimed the novel power to commandeer the people to enter into contracts with private companies. As in Prince, the novelty of this attractive power suggests that it does not exist. For example, during World War II, rather than sell war bonds, Congress could have mandated their purchase. Rather than prohibit farmers like Roscoe Filburn from growing wheat in excess of their quota, thereby inducing them to go into the interstate market for wheat, Congress could simply have mandated that all farmers buy some wheat. In short, Prince tells us that a power that is both this novel and this attractive probably doesn't exist. Ultimately, Justice Scalia rejected the government's reliance on the necessary and proper clause by characterizing a state commandeering power as improper. But however, but however necessary it may have been, by the same token, however necessary it may have been to its regulation of the insurance companies, the power to commandeer individuals this way, to buy individual insurance uh, policies, is also improper. Now, the second point that Judge Kavanaugh made was an observation that this claim of power is, in his words, uncabined. In all phases of this litigation, the government has failed to identify any constitutional limiting principle on the power of Congress to issue economic mandates. During the argument in the Sky 7 case, Judges Kavanaugh and Silverman unsuccessfully pressed the government's attorney for 10 very long minutes to identify any economic mandates that would be outside the power of Congress to enact if this mandate is constitutional. The government's only real response to date to this challenge is some variant of the, of the claim that health care is different, that health care is different. It, even if it's true that on some factual basis health care is different, this does not provide a judicially administrable limit on the commerce power of, con uh, of Congress. And this was a major concern expressed by Judges Dabina, Dabina and Hall in their jointly ordered, uh, authored 11th Circuit opinion when they wrote as follows, quote, we are at a loss as to how such fact-based criteria can serve as the sort of judicially enforceable limitations on the commerce power that the Supreme Court has repeatedly emphasized as necessary to that enumerated power. Were we to adopt the limiting principles proffered by the government, courts would sit in judgment over every economic mandate issued by Congress, determining whether the level of participation in the underlying market, the amount of cost shifting, the unpredictability of need, or the strength of the moral imperative were enough to justify the mandate. Ultimately, they concluded, the government, quote, the government struggled to articulate cognizable, judicially administrable limiting principles only reiterates the conclusion we reach today, there are none. So whenever defenders of the insurance mandate say some variation on, well, health care is different, then you need to ask them, well, yes, okay, fine, but what constitutional limitation are you proposing for this power? In a recent debate on C-SPAN, Akhil Amar, uh, a Yale law professor, Akhil Amar, proclaimed that, quote, we don't need constitutional lawyers and judges pulling limiting principles out of thin air to limit the ability of Congress to pass silly laws, unquote. And, quote, the limiting principle is vote the bums out, unquote. With all due respect to Professor Amar, this answer just will not work in front of the current Supreme Court, nor should it. But it is highly revealing that this is the answer that a smart guy, like that's the, this is the best answer that a smart guy like Akhil Amar can come up with. In my view, the absence of a judicially administrable constitutional limiting principle on the power to impose economic mandates is a huge problem for the government. Third, Judge Kavanaugh noted that Congress could have accomplished all or most of what it wanted to accomplish simply by exercising its tax power in various ways, but it chose not to, and we all know why. First, any tax would have violated the President's highly visible pledge during the campaign not to raise any taxes on persons making less than $200,000 a year. Second, there just weren't 60 Democratic votes in the Senate for anything that amounted to a tax increase, for anything that amounted to a single payer mandatory Medicare for everyone scheme, or even a voluntary Medicare program for anyone who wants it, the so-called public option. The votes just weren't there. I don't believe that the mandate scheme was really ever intended to become law. 
Instead, it was merely intended to get the 60 Democratic senators on board to send the matter to a conference committee with the House who would then write the real bill. But when Scott Brown got elected in Massachusetts on this issue, the Democrats were forced to adopt the Senate bill in the House or possibly get nothing at all. So at, over the objection of many Democrats in the House, they enacted the bill and were stuck with the constitutionality of this dubious mandate. And even a couple weeks ago, testifying before Congress, the acting OMB director denied that the penalty that enforces this bill uh, was an exercise of the tax power, or was a tax. But the fact that Congress has other powers, but it, that it failed to exercise for political reasons, undermines the imperative to uphold this new power as a means of addressing the perceived problems with the health care system. Fourth and finally, given that Congress has ample powers to address fundamental health care reform without a mandate, Judge Kavanaugh asked, why then open a new chapter of congressional power by extending the commerce power in so dangerous a way? Now here he made what was for me a new argument, and by this point I've been involved in this whole issue for over a year and a half, so any new argument was pretty interesting to hear. And it was a new argument against sustaining this power to impose economic mandates under the Commerce Clause. Unlike the tax and spending power that is necessarily limited to monetary subsidies and, and, inact and exactions, sustaining economic mandates under the Commerce Power would empower Congress to impose any penalty up to and including uh, in prison terms for violating the economic mandates it may impose in the future. Now, it's true that in this case, with this law, Congress limited itself to a small, or, or not so small in some people's case, monetary penalty or fine. But in the future, if this is upheld as a Commerce Clause regulation, the full panoply of legal sanctions would be available to enforce future mandates. Judge Kavanaugh seems sincerely troubled by the dangerous nature of this new and unprecedented expansion of federal power. Um, federal power. So does the, does the Commerce Clause really give Congress the power to imprison any American who does not buy a product or service that it might mandate? When discussing whether a statute is constitutional, we need to distinguish three different senses of the word. First, we could mean whether it is unconstitutional according to what the Constitution says. That's the old-fashioned way of doing it. Uh, to my mind, the power to mandate that persons do business with private companies is simply not authorized by the enacted or original meaning of the tax. Second, we could mean whether it is unconstitutional according to what the Supreme Court has said in the past. Again, because such a power is quite literally unprecedented, the Supreme Court has never ruled to uphold it. And finally, we could mean, as a predictive matter, whether you can count to five justices for upholding the statute. So are there five justices on the Supreme Court to extend Congress's power to include the, imp the imposition of economic mandates? We all know that justices typically bend over backwards to uphold acts of Congress, especially popular acts of Congress. Recently, however, the Associated Press and the National Constitution Center asked Americans the following question. Do you think the federal government should have the power to require all Americans buy health insurance and to pay a fine if they don't, or do you think the federal government should not have that power? 82% of respondents answered no to this question, and only 16% answered yes. A new Quinnipiac poll released last week shows that by a margin of 13 percentage points, 52 to 39, Americans support the repeal of President Obama's centerpiece legislation. This is polling that's quite consistent over time. And earlier this week, a new USA Today Gallup poll showed that 72% of Americans believe the individual mandate is unconstitutional, including 56% of Democrats and 54% of those who think, quote, health care, the health care law is a good thing. Only 20% of Americans believe the mandate is constitutional. If nothing else, this degree of bipartisan opposition means that the court will not be facing a popular backlash should it decide to invalidate the mandate. So, I'm just wrap, this is my conclusion. Now, I want to emphasize that I, I do not believe that the court would un invalidate the mandate simply because it is unpopular. But I do think that the unpopularity of the mandate might make the court more open to com a compelling constitutional objection to the individual mandate that they might otherwise find ways to avoid. And this is especially true when they can strike down this measure without undermining any other exercise of the commerce power that is now on the books. And why is that? Because this has never been done before. When invalidating the mandate, the court needs strike down no other law that's ever been enacted in the history of the United States. All it needs say is that Congress may go as far as it has gone until 2010 and no farther. Although a victory for our challenge would represent an important reaffirmation of the that the federal government is one of limited and enumerated powers, nothing else the Congress has ever done 
will be called into question and constitutional law will otherwise remain exactly where it's been. But if we lose, then Congress will have a new and dangerous power and the court will have abdicated its responsibility to preserve the enumeration of powers. I think all this explains why the challenges have the momentum they do, why the justices granted three days of oral argument to hear this case, and why I am hopeful that the Supreme Court will hold that the individual insurance mandate is unconstitutional. Thank you. Professor Carlin, we'll give you some extra time. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, 30 years ago, I sat roughly where many of you are sitting today. Um, not exactly, uh, not in this room and the like, but um, unlike I think everyone else in the audience, although perhaps Richard Epstein will tell me I'm wrong about this, I was one of the only people to actually attend the first ever uh, convention of the Federalist Society, which was held at Yale when I was a law student there, and I was invited by my uh, friend and later roommate, Steve Calabresi. Uh, so it's a pleasure to welcome all of you to uh, my backyard now and to continue a conversation where I'm not sure we actually convince each other of very much other than that we all care about the Constitution. Uh, so what should we make of the following argument about the individual mandate? This mandate assumes that there's an implicit contract between households and society based on the notion that health insurance is not like other forms of insurance protection. If a young man wrecks his Porsche and has not had the foresight to obtain insurance, we may commiserate, but society feels no obligation to repair his car. But health care is different. If a man is struck down by a heart attack in the street, Americans will care for him whether he has insurance or not. If we find that he spent his money on other things rather than insurance, we may be angry, but we will not deny him services even if that means more prudent citizens end up paying the tab. That argument is not part of the government's defense of the Affordable Care Act. Rather, it's a quotation from a Heritage Foundation-sponsored report in 1989 on ensuring health care for all Americans. That report formed the intellectual underpinnings for what was called the Consumer Choice Health Security Act of 1994, sponsored by 24 Republican senators. That act contained an individual mandate that looks very much like the mandate we're here to talk about today. A similar set of ideas about individual mandates informed the comprehensive health care reforms in Massachusetts that we might call Obamacare. Uh, oh, I mean Romney care. So whatever one might think about the general question of the coexistence of limited government in the administrative state that serves as the theme for this symposium, it would be a mistake to think of the Affordable Care Act as a radical redefinition of either the government's role or of freedom more generally. Ironically, as Randy pointed out, a more expansive program, say a single payer government government run system funded from general tax revenues, we could call it Johnson Care. Uh, for the under 65 non-indigent crowd, because it would look like Medicaid and Medicare, that would have garnered fewer constitutional objections. So in thinking about what to say to you in my opening remarks, I want to set to one side a possible set of arguments against the constitutionality of the mandate and of the Affordable Care Act as a whole that rest on a rejection of the New Deal settlement. So if you think that the act is unconstitutional because commerce is a discrete subset of the broader category of economic activity, and thus that health care or insurance is not commerce, I actually don't have much to say to you beyond quoting what Justice Jackson wrote in Wickard against Filburn that questions of the power of Congress are not to be decided by reference to any formula which would give controlling force to nomenclature, and what Justice Scalia says to people like me about Bush versus Gore. Get over it. The New Deal settlement is not going away. So I start from the premise that the market for health care generally and the market for health care more specifically involves interstate commerce that Congress has the power to regulate under Article I, Section 8. Congress thus has authority to require guaranteed issue, to require community rating, to prohibit various restrictions based on an insured person or, or, or applicant's pre-existing conditions and the like. Now Article I gives Congress the power to regulate commerce. And we've known since the lottery case in 1903 that prohibition can be a form of regulation. Now, if proscription can constitute regulation, it's not clear why prescription can't as well. So let's start with whether the word regulate could cover inducing someone to enter commerce who would choose not to do so absent the regulation. As a textual matter, it can. 
As Judge Silberman wrote in Seven Sky Against Holder, uh, quoting Samuel Johnson's 1773 dictionary definition, uh, at the time the Constitution was fashioned to regulate meant as it does now, to adjust by rule or method, as well as to direct. To direct, in turn, included to prescribe certain measures, to mark out a certain course, and to order or to command. In other words, to regulate can require action, and nothing in the definition appears to limit that power only to those already active in relation to an interstate market. And as a matter of constitutional values as well, it can. Uh, one overarching theme of the original Constitution was the desire to create a commercial republic and to encourage a more vibrant economy. The Commerce Clause was part of that broader commitment, so obviously Congress can encourage individuals to enter into transactions they might not otherwise have chosen. Moreover, when it comes to health care, most Americans are actually like the marijuana that Justice uh, Scalia wrote about in Gonzales against Raich. So think of yourself as one big joint. You are, and here I quote, never more than an instant from the interstate market. Most Americans will need health care at some point in their lives, and unfortunately, many of us are never more than an unplanned instant away from that market and from the possibility, if we don't carry insurance, that we cannot cover the cost of the care we expect. So the argument for the mandate flows directly from Wickard against Filburn and Raich. The Affordable Care Act is a comprehensive regulation and reform of health care. Congress concluded that aspects of the act would be undercut if individuals could refuse to purchase insurance until they needed care, thus the mandate. Moreover, Congress concluded that broadening in the insurance pool to include healthy individuals would help to lower insurance premiums and administrative costs. Now, maybe Congress was wrong about those administrative ju empirical judgments. I don't know. I'm just a law professor. But the constitutional question is not whether Congress's judgment was correct. Rather, it's whether Congress's judgment was rational. And as the Supreme Court held two years ago in United States against Comstock, the Constitution addresses the choice of means primarily to the judgment of Congress. Or as the court stated in a 1934 def decision on which Justice Breyer's opinion in Comstock relied, if it can be seen that the means adopted are really calculated to attain the end, the degree of their necessity, the extent to which they conduce to the end, the closeness of the relationship between the means adopted and the end to be obtained are matters for congressional determination alone. There is surely enough evidence for Congress to believe that ensuring all Americans carry adequate insurance is critical to regulating the health care market. So we come essentially to the final objection. Isn't there something wrong with making people buy something they don't want? If there is, and there probably is, it's not that that compulsion violates the Commerce Clause. Rather, it's that it violates some other constitutional constraint. For example, if the government denied Jews the right to sell bicycles that have moved in interstate commerce, that law would be unconstitutional because it violates the First Amendment, not because it's somehow not a regulation of commerce. If Congress were to pass an act requiring everyone in America to eat macadamia nuts, and I picked macadamia nuts rather than broccoli because they're actually grown in only one state, as far as I know, Hawaii, and therefore if you had to eat them, they would have all moved in interstate commerce, that would be a regulation of interstate commerce since the nuts are grown in Hawaii. But it would run afoul of, in my case, substantive due process, or in Randy's case, the Ninth Amendment, uh, for Congress to force people to ingest a substance without Congress having a really compelling ju justification. Uh, now, uh, what about could Congress force you to buy a GM car? I know that's a popular one now because it seems much larger than broccoli. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and so one thing is, Congress did force you to buy a GM car. They forced all of us to buy a GM car. We just didn't get the car. <laughs> and that's what taxation means. So what about this action in action line that constitutional critics of the individual mandate draw? I, I think they assume a bright line where in reality the line is much more complicated. First, as I've already suggested, Congress can reasonably assume that virtually everyone will spend money on health care during his or her lifetime. That spending itself is clearly economic activity within Congress's reach. What the individual mandate does is to regulate the timing of the activity, in essence for forcing people to pay upfront as part of a pool rather than to gamble that they'll be able to pay when the services are needed or that society will pay for the services if they can't. Now as the great progressive justice Louis Brandeis once remarked, sometimes the most important thing we do is not doing. He was talking about judicial restraint 
But when you think about the Affordable Care Act, there's a, the truth of this statement uh, is driven home in a particularly poignant and powerful way. One of the original plaintiffs in the case now before the court was Mary Brown. She asserted in her complaint that she did not want to have to buy insurance for herself or for the employees of her small business. But on December 7th of last year, her lawyers informed the Supreme Court by letter that her business had closed and that Mrs. Brown had filed a petition for personal bankruptcy. Go to her Schedule F, where she lists her unsecured creditors, and you will find $2,700 worth of unpaid medical expenses. For many Americans, as Congress found, unpaid and unexpected medical expenses can be a final straw throwing them financially underwater. We all pay Mary Brown's medical care through taxes and through higher premiums for those of us who've bought insurance. So when people ask rhetorically, could the government force you to buy insurance? They already have. They forced me to insure Mary Brown. Moreover, the critics have never explained why an inaction distinction should apply to Congress's exercise of its commerce power in light of the fact that in exercising its other enumerated powers, such as running the court system or providing for the national defense, Congress has long required individuals to engage in activities they might otherwise choose not to perform. Jury service and registration for the draft are the two most ex familiar examples of this. Indeed, if you go to the government's website for selective service, you'll find that actually the government compels people who don't own computers and who don't particularly want to be uh, drafted to buy something they don't want. So let me just quote a little from the government's website. You can register by mail using a selective service mailback registration form available at any post office. A man can fill it in, sign it, affix postage, and mail it to selective service. So if buying a stamp can be compelled, I'm not sure why buying insurance can't. And for those opponents of the individual mandate who want to return to the time of the framers, here's another example. The Militia Act of 1792 required white men between the ages of 18 and 45 to provide themselves with muskets and other equipment. Now presumably most of those people weren't smelting them in their backyards. They had to go out and actually buy the musket. Because the national welfare required it, Congress required individuals to purchase goods from the market. Sure, the individual mandate is innovative, but I can't do better in responding to that point than quote from Justice Holmes' dissent in Lochner, he was right then and he's right now. A constitution is not intended to embody a particular economic theory, whether of paternalism and the organic relation of the citizen to the state or of laissez-faire. It is made for people of fundamentally differing views, and the accident of our finding certain opinions natural and familiar, or novel and even shocking, ought not to conclude our judgment upon the question whether statutes embodying them conflict with the Constitution of the United States. Thank you very much. We'll now have five minute rebuttals, starting with Professor Barnett. Well, as always, I, I always enjoy hearing Pam. Um, I always enjoy her more when I'm not opposed to her, I think, but uh, I, always, I always enjoy hearing her. Uh, let me just go through a couple of the points that she made and, and uh, uh, in the order that she made them. Uh, first of all, uh, her opening uh, point that the, this particular proposal is not a radical pr proposal. It wouldn't fundamentally change, uh, for example, the relationship of citizens to the state. Uh, because it was a proposal that was uh, formally pr promoted by Republicans and conservatives uh, like the Heritage Foundation. First of all, I, I happen to know the guy uh, who promoted this from the Heritage Foundation, Stuart Butler, who's the head of their health policy. Uh, and I'll just say this one thing about Stuart Butler. He's a Brit. You know him. He's your friend, and I'm no Stuart Butler. No, he's, <laughs> he's a Brit. Uh, so I wouldn't necessarily expect him to be sensitive to uh, the American constitutional system when he proposes something like this. So uh, it, it just goes to show that uh, uh, the fact, I mean, this, this actually I wouldn't think would be news to Pam, the fact that someone's a conservative does not automatically uh, mean that they have sound constitutional judgment. Um, uh, and uh, <laughs> the fact that someone's a Republican might even have less correlation uh, with having a sound constitutional judgment. So. Um, <laughs> 
anyway, uh, uh, that, but, but it's radical in this sense. I mean, I, I agree that this is sort of a, you know, this is a kind of a, it's kind of nationalizing the insurance companies to administer uh, a, a national health care system by making them regulated public utilities, and that's probably slightly more desirable than having the government run it all. So fine. It's a little bit more moderate than that. But it's radical in the following sense. Massachusetts gets to do this because Massachusetts has a general police power. Uh, and in order for Congress to get to do this, you're really going to have, the court's going to actually have to say that Congress has a general police power too. And for, for the court to say, intimate, imply, or in effect hold that Congress has a, a general police power to do what a state can do is a very radical proposition. And it's one that the court has consistently denied uh, throughout our history and reaffirmed its denial of it, uh, of that proposition in the cases of Lopez and Morrison most recently. All right, so that's the first point. The second point uh, has to do with mandates um, uh, and why man whether mandates can be included under the meaning of the word regulate. Uh, for first of all, the, you know, the, the, the term regulate means regulate commerce, and, and the term does seem to suppose that you're regulating some, an activity called commerce, which is an activity that's already in existence. Uh, the idea that the power to regulate commerce is the power to create the commerce then you would th that you would then regulate is somewhat of a stretch when it comes to uh, a, consti a constitutional interpretation, the meaning of the Constitution, notwithstanding the fact that the word direct might be somewhere down the list of dictionary, dictionary synonyms uh, in um, Johnson's dictionary. Uh, and the fact is that regulation has never been held by the Supreme Court to include this power to mandate. The word regulation has, and in fact, the word regulation didn't get held, uh, upheld to include the power uh, to prescribe as opposed to make regular until Champion versus Ames in the early 20th century. I think, by the way, Champion versus Ames is, is probably correct uh, in its conclusion about the meaning of the word regulate uh, for a variety of historical reasons. But the, it's ne the court has never decided that the, that, the, that the power to mandate is included in that. So that's a novel question. It's actually the question to be decided here. But it's not true that under the power to regulate interstate commerce, commerce has an unlimited choice of means to accomplish its end, provided it's really trying to accomplish its end, um, uh, subject only to, for example, the express prohibitions of the Constitution as uh, exemplified by the Bill of Rights or the Due Process Clause or the Ninth Amendment. And we know that's true because of the Prince case. Because in the Prince case, Congress was exercising its commerce power by commandeering or really mandating that the state legislatures pass laws of certain kinds and as a result of a principle that is not expressly stated in the Constitution, other than indirectly by the Tenth Amendment, the court held that this was an improper, an improper means, however necessary it may be, it's an improper means of executing Congress's regulatory power over Congress to make a sovereign, and now there's reasons for that, to make a sovereign body exercise its legislative powers. But when you think about it, the power to enter into contracts is each one of our sovereign powers as a member of the people. Um, normally, contracts require consent. I was a contracts professor. I'll go back to that now. I was a contracts professor. And it's an age-old principle that contracts require the mutual assent of the parties, and they're not supposed to be coerced. And yet, that's precisely what the individual mandate does. It interferes with the sovereign power of individuals to consent to enter into contracts. Contracts. Um, and that violates the Tenth Amendment too, which I will remind you protects not only the reserve powers of the states, but also the reserve powers of the people, the words that the Tenth Amendment ends in. Um, finally, let me talk, um, well, there's two more points. I want to talk about whether, why mandates are substantively different besides the historical claim and the textual claim. They're substantively different by, you can see how they're substantively different by considering the following thought experiment. Supposing I tell you a hundred things that you may not do tomorrow. You may not ride a bike, you may not go on a treadmill, you may not eat broccoli, and a hundred other things that you may not do tomorrow. You, if, if, if I were to do that and I had authority over you, your liberty tomorrow would be restricted. There would be these hundred things you couldn't do, but there would be an infinite number of things left to you that you could still do. Now suppose that I had the power to mandate that you do a hundred things tomorrow. You must eat broccoli, you must ride on a bicycle, you must ride on a treadmill, you must buy a car, you must, and a hundred other things you must do. That power, if I had that power over you, I would essentially have the power to control your life because there's only a finite, you only have a finite amount of time and you only have a finite amount of resources. So mandates are really a completely different manner than even prohibitions, much less regulations, a pure regulation which tells you how to do something. 
And the final point I would make has to do with the other mandates. We have never argued, and I've, I have never claimed, that the, that the Congress doesn't have the power to mandate that you do anything the Congress has. For one thing, it has the power to conscript you uh, into the armed forces uh, and make you fight and die for your country. It has the power to make you serve on jury trial, uh, to make you serve on juries. It has the power to make you fill out a tax form. And I discovered in the course of the lit this litigation, it also has the power to make you uh, uh, join a posse comitatus if a uh, U.S. Marshal is in the vicinity and is trying to enforce federal law. So it turns out that's another mandate that it can do. Now, um, w does that mean that Therefore, the power of mandate is not problematic? No, because each one of these mandates is, first of all, directly related to service to the government itself. Each is directly related to the very existence of the government itself. And each constitutes one form or another of what the Supreme Court said, uh, characterized when it, when it upheld the Selective Service Law. It said it was part of the supreme and noble duty of Americans to provide for the defense of their country in return for the protection that the country gives them. So it's basically these mandates are for the government. They are part and parcel of what it means to be an American citizen in order to uh, serve the federal government. Whether you, as a libertarian, agree with that or not, that is the way they are decided. And what the defenders of this mandate are basically saying, because the Congress has the power to make you fight and die for your country, it has the power to make you do anything less than that. And it, any power that has the power to make you any, do anything less than that is essentially the powers that slaveholders have over slaves. And if, in fact, the government really does have that power over us, then I would say, the, and I don't say that the court will actually find this, even if we lose the case, but if, the, if, but if that principle was ever upheld in those terms, then essentially that would change the fundamental relationship of the citizen to the state, and we would essentially be better off be called subjects rather than citizens. Um, I, let me start with kind of, I think, the places where we do agree and then get to the places where we don't agree. We both agree that there are constraints on what the government can make you do. Uh, and we agree that those constraints come from important notions of liberty. Where I think Randy and I disagree is on two other uh, points. One is whether this particular mandate actually deprives you of some important liberty. Uh, and the second is on whether uh, those constraints should be smuggled into a definition of what counts as commerce or what counts as necessary and proper uh, regulation of commerce rather than standing uh, on their own. And I think that's an area of kind of profound methodological uh, disagreement between, between Randy and me. So uh, here's, uh, here's what I think. Uh, this is not a case about a general police power. This is a case about regulating the economy. The healthcare industry occupies a huge percentage of our gross domestic product. Almost every American will uh, use healthcare at some point in the near future. Most Americans use, use some form of healthcare in any given year. So regulating that uh, activity is paradigmatic regulation of the economy. And for those of us who uh, agree with the Supreme Court's abandonment of the production, extraction, commerce distinction, uh, it's commerce. And so it's not a question of can the government regulate health care. Of course they can. Uh, and they regulate it in a whole bunch of ways that I don't think anybody would challenge. Uh, then the question becomes, well, is this a, a necessary and proper way of regulating it? And I think the answer to that question is yes, because the standard for that is asking whether Congress could rationally think that there's a connection between making people buy insurance and having an insurance system and a healthcare system that works. They might be right about that, they might be wrong about that, but everybody agrees, I think, that our healthcare system right now ha faces a number of crises. And that's why I started with the quotation from the Heritage uh, Committee uh, uh, publication and a reference to the Republicans' uh, earlier healthcare plan. Not because I was trying to play a gotcha, but simply to suggest that people on every side are struggling with this issue, and people of genuine goodwill who disagree on a wide variety of areas could say that this was an appropriate way. Uh, many of us don't think it was the best way. Indeed, it's hard to find anybody who thinks this is the best law that could have been written absent any constraints. Uh, the people who need that uh, probably do need health care, but of a mental health care sort. Um, so 
This is regulation of the economy. And then the only question becomes, is, is this the first step on the road to slavery? And I think not. Uh, I think that it is a first step on a road to making sure that Americans, regardless of their economic status or their employment status, have access to health care. And it's a first step on making sure that we don't end up depriving other people of their rights by forcing us to pay taxes and forcing us to pay higher insurance premiums so that they can get health care that we as a society uh, feel they have to get and are unwilling to deny them if they make the wrong economic choices. Well, I'm going to ask a question, and while I do that, you have an opportunity to go to the microphones and uh, get ready to, to pepper our panelists. And, and my question is first for uh, Professor Carlin. Um, you seem to suggest that you agree that the government could make you buy, and I guess eat, macadamia nuts under the Commerce Clause, and then you suggested that maybe the limiting principle could be the substantive due process principle. Um, is that really a limiting principle? Could, could we really say it shocks the conscience and is fundamentally unfair to an ordered conception of liberty to require us to buy macadamia nuts? Um, so let me clarify slightly my answer, which is I think that if the government says you must buy macadamia nuts, they are regulating commerce. That is that the problem with a law that says you must buy macadamia nuts is not that it's not about commerce in some sense. Uh, I then think that there are a variety of arguments for, the, although the government could be like your parents and make you come and look at the macadamia nuts, they can't make you eat them. Right? It's like the broccoli <laughs> argument, which is your parents could make you sit there and look at the broccoli, but they can't make you eat it. Um, so I do think that there are very strong arguments that say that the government cannot force you to ingest a substance for no reason at all. Now, we know the government under some circumstances can force you to ingest a substance because we have substantive due process cases about forced medication of prisoners and the like. Uh, so it's not that the government can never do it. It's that for free people out there in the world, I think the answer is the government couldn't do it. And I'm confident there's not a judge in America uh, who would make somebody eat macadamia nuts but that they didn't want to eat. Um, so I'm pretty confident that that's where the limit is. It's not that it's not a regulation of commerce. Let's go to the, the questions. Uh, can you identify yourself and then make sure you frame your question in the form of a question? It, yes, Your Honor. Uh, ben Dexter. Uh, President uh, at New England Law in Boston. Um, this question is directed towards Professor Carlin, and it's basically if the government can force you to buy health insurance via its commerce power, then how do you prevent making all the rest of the enumerated powers superfluous? I mean, the enumerated powers tells Congress they have the power to create bankruptcy law, coin money, uh, establish post office and post roads. It seems to me if they became that specific um, as to those other subjects, then you know, uh, how would they be able to uh, th therefore force you to buy health insurance? It seems like it's just, maybe it's a commerce question in general, but as to this uh, specificity, specificity, again, how do you prevent from rendering all the other uh, powers superfluous? Well, because I don't, th I don't think, for example, the post office clause or the road building cl clause, I think those go to the power of Congress to build the things, not the question of making you buy uh, stamps or the like. So I don't think that those particular powers would be rendered superfluous by a requirement that Congress could tell you uh, to buy something that's being sold by a market. Thank you, professors. Meredith Williams, Stanford Law School. Um, just had a question sort of touching on Professor Carlin. You mentioned the difference. Well, you mentioned Obamacare slash Romney care. And Professor Barnett mentioned the difference between sort of the police power in the states versus the federal government. I was sort of wondering on the first hand, uh, is there anything in the Constitution that would protect us against the state's assertion of power? Or is it sort of assumed that people could move states and um, on the other hand, are there any, what are, what are the sort of benefits or drawbacks of having states uh, regulate health care in that way versus the federal government? Yeah, I, I think it's, a, uh, it's an important question. Um, I think there would, ought to be a due process clause objection that you could make against the states exercising this power uh, as a, along the lines that uh, Pam said, but I don't think that under existing doctrine it would succeed. 
And this, this challenge is all based on existing doctrine. It's not based on the original meaning of the Constitution, which I think is pretty clearly shows that the mandate's not constitutional. It is based on existing doctrine. And so I think states under existing law do have this power. And But one of the reasons why states by uh, historically uh, do have a broader power than Congress, under the original meaning of the Constitution even, is that there is, for, for, apart from historical reasons why that's the way it happened, is that uh, when any state exercises their broader powers in an impressive way, there's a competition uh, uh, between them and other states, and people who really don't like it can move to another state without giving up their American citizenship, without leaving the country that they were born in. Uh, as a result, there is a constraint placed on states by the existence of this competition, and it's precisely to avoid those constraints that legislation gets moved to the federal level, because the people who advocate those policies, which aren't popular enough to be enacted state by state, um, are moved to want to enact it nationally, because then they force you to leave the whole country before you leave that, lose that policy, uh, before you have to, to avoid that policy. So for this reason, even having somewhat greater powers in the hands of states is checked. Uh, by other forces that constrain the exercise of those powers that would not exist at the national level when the only check on those powers you have essentially are you know, national elections or a judi judicial review, and, the, and, and by and large judicial review has not proven to be a very robust uh, check on, on national power. I mean, that's a great question. It, it does, uh, you know, there's a kind of flip side to what Randy was talking about here, which is the judgment that some issues can't be dealt with on the state level because of the externalities of the state. So if you're a state that wanted to create a really robust uh, single-payer health system, one of the problems you would face is you build that system and it's like, you know, it's the sort of, you know, eight men out theory or something or, you know, if you build it, they will come. Uh, you will end up like a field of dreams with everybody moving to your state. And so I think part of the answer is the reason we've moved to the idea of national uh, solutions for this problem is that state level solutions are going to be very hard to fix in this to, to, to make effective in the same way that we moved to national nationwide uh, unemployment insurance during the New Deal because the idea that states would serve as kind of magnets uh, for people moving across state lines because of the national guarantee of the right under the 14th Amendment to move to another state and become its citizen. So it's a kind of delicate balance there of whether it's better to have uh, federalism or effective, uh, effective solutions at the national level. But I, I do think this also illustrates why, one of the many reasons why Justice Holmes was wrong in his dissenting opinion in Lochner, uh, and that is that the very existence of this competitive federalism do, does make the United States form of government, structure of government, incompatible with certain kinds of political ideologies, uh, which we would say are, are more all-embracing, shall we say. To the extent the public doesn't want them, people are free to flee within the United States, and that provides a structural check on those policies, which which was one of the impetuses, impetus, impeti, is that the word? Uh, I think it's impetus, because I think it might be fourth declension, but I could just be making that up. Um, it's one, one of the motivations uh, for uh, why the federal constitution, the powers under the federal constitution had to be distorted in order to render it more powerful than it otherwise would be so, to, as to, so as to avoid this structural constraint that's built into our constitution. Next. Hi, David Silvers, Georgetown University Law Center. This question's for Professor Carlin. Um, you know, a big part of the, the justification for healthcare is that the healthcare market is special, and that's some sort of limiting principle. But is it functionally any sort of limit, or is it going to be the case that once the saying the court accepts healthcare is special, that they have to accept all future markets as special? That if Congress says cars are in fact special, or that broccoli is in fact special, that the court will just automatically accept it? So I'm wondering. If we accept that healthcare is special as an argument, do we really have any functional limits after that? I actually don't think it's so much that healthcare is special that supports my argument, because my argument is this is a regulation of commerce, and Congress, having decided to regulate comprehensively in this area, can then uh, decide to have an individual mandate as part of it. I mean, there are people who think, well, healthcare is totally different. Um, I think there it's the political check that you're not going to see Congress passing a law, at least under any set of circumstances I can imagine, where they will say, you have to buy the car, because what they'll do is they'll use the tax power there and the general, general tax and spend power, and we'll end up exactly where I am, which is, we did all buy cars. We just didn't get them. It's not that you didn't buy a car. 
the government charged you for a car and then somebody else bought the car. At least with the health insurance thing, you get the health insurance. Uh, Pam did not make this argument, so she's right not to have to respond to that particular question. Uh, but the government, I do think, has made that argument yeah. consistently. Um, and I, if that argument were really offered as a good faith, real, legal, uh, uh, limiting principle, then, then we who deny that health care is different would be entitled to a hearing. We, we'd be a remand. We'd have to have a hearing. We could call, we could call witnesses and figure out and have a factual determination whether health care is different than other industries. And then there'd have to be a standard of review with respect to that determination if it was, in fact, a judicially enforceable limit. But the very fact that there would be no such hearing, like in the Rach case, there was no such hearing. The government got to make up what it was that the what reaching medical marijuana in California, what, why that was important for them, and we never got a hearing on that. Uh, because it's, the fact that we would get no hearing on this, and so therefore there would never be a factual determination, indicates it's not a limiting principle. Not a limiting principle of the kind that's being asked for, which is, which is a, judicially be, a, judicial, a judicially administrable limiting principle. Hi, I'm Jordan Pratt from the University of Florida Student Chapter. I'm the president there. Um, this question is directed towards uh, Professor Carlin. Uh, Professor Carlin, I think that you mentioned that, um, uh, in your view, the word regulate includes the power to force people into transactions they otherwise would not have completed. Um, and I, I believe Professor Barnett did not concede um, on your definition of regulation. But even, even if he were to have conceded uh, on that point, there still remains the question of what is being regulated, whether it's commerce or something else. Um, in your view, is the failure to purchase a commodity an activity that substantially affects commerce? Is it commerce or is it something else? And if, and if it is commerce, um, where, where, where would you find support for the proposition that a failure to purchase a commodity uh, constitutes commerce? I think there are two ways to answer that question, and I, I sort of have, in my own mind, oscillated back and forth between them. One is that you regulate, commer you regulate commerce in the sense that forcing somebody to engage in commerce is regulating commerce. Uh, so that's one way of answering the question. Uh, in the same way that if I say, uh, let's take a law that says the a state will regulate uh, uh, education, Having a truancy law that forces students to go to school is a regulation of education. It forces them to engage in education they wouldn't otherwise engage in. So that's one way that I answer the question. Sometimes the other way, and, I, and as I confess, I kind of oscillate back and forth between these, is even if this is not itself commerce, uh, the government is entitled under the necessary and proper clause to address things that are not themselves the enumerated power for the purposes of um, uh, carrying out the enumerated power. So, for example, in United States against Comstock, the enumerated power goes to whether or not, uh, you know, there's a regulation of commerce in the sense of regulating odometers, let's say, uh, on cars that are shipped interstate. Then the necessary and proper clause says you can criminalize, some, criminalize something that it interferes with that commerce. And the necessary and proper clause also says, for example, you can build prisons to put people in prison who violated law. Why? Because having prisons will help to deter activities uh, that interfere with interstate commerce. And so under that way of thinking about things, even if the individual who's being forced to buy the health care is not uh, himself or herself engaged in interstate commerce, it would be forcing somebody to do something that is necessary for Congress's regulation of the markets in health care and in insurance. No, I, th I think we go on. Do a question up here. Any chance? Go ahead. I think that they haven't gotten a chance. Don't oh, jump. Up there. Sorry. <laughs> Don't jump. I, so I was about to ask one more question for it. Uh, Daniel Pollack, I'm a 3L at Penn. Uh, my question is for Professor Carlin. Um, you had mentioned the uh, draft as a mandate, uh, as a sort of proof or an example for why the individual mandate uh, for health care should be or is constitutional. Uh, however, if you Obviously, as you know, there are certain amendments that were uh, um, added uh, to the Bill of Rights specifically, apparently, specifically to deal with um, the draft exactly with this provision. It was discussed among the, the founding fathers, among the drafters of the Constitution. So my question would be, um, can you address the constitutionality of the individual mandate uh, through a prism of the fact that it's not mentioned in the Constitution that the individual mandate um, I'm sorry, that, that the Commerce Clause allows mandates, um, as well as the fact there are no protections uh, for things like making us buy macadamia nuts. It's, it's one thing to say no judge would ever force somebody to do that, um, 
why would that not be in uh, the Constitution itself if, they had, if the founders had intended for the Commerce, the Commerce Clause to include uh, mandates? Well, they didn't even know there was Hawaii, right? It was <laughs> the first Western people to uh, land in Hawaii landed the same year as the Declaration of Independence. I, I guess some of this is a fundamental disagreement probably between the two of us on just how uh, much something has to be expressed in the Constitution for it to be implicit, uh, to be implicit in the powers. That is, I don't think that the framers of our Constitution could have foreseen the country that we became. I think the document that they wrote is capacious enough uh, to enable us to solve the problems of our generation in the same way that it was capacious enough to solve the problems of generations before us. But it's not because I can find uh, a health care clause in the Constitution or a mandate clause in the Constitution. I can't do that. And I think people who pretend to do that uh, are disingenuous. It's because I think that the Constitution was created uh, in part to enable a national government to deal with unforeseen and unforeseeable problems uh, in later generations. You know, the American Constitution is the oldest written constitution in the world by like an order of magnitude. The average national constitution lasts 17 years and then they rewrite it with incredible specificity to deal with problems. You know, and so most constitutions last as long as a house cat. Um, our constitution is more like a redwood, and uh, in that sense, it is, I hate to use this phrase because I know how much it upsets people, but it's a living constitution. It's a constitution to deal with the problems of our generation, uh, and I think it's broad enough to do that. Um, Jay Schweikert, I'm a law clerk for uh, Judge Diane Sykes. Um, Professor Carlin, you were saying that you agreed with Professor Barnett that there are limitations on what the government can force you to buy, consume, whatever, but that those are sort of sound in liberty, not in, in the Commerce Clause itself, and they should find their independent justification. But it seems like that sort of argument apply, could apply is just as well to other Commerce Clause cases, such as Lopez and Morrison. I mean, you could have easily characterized Lopez as the liberty to carry guns near schools, and, you know, so that's, but that should be its own due process argument, and because, you know, regulate and commerce is brought in because necessary and proper, we defer to Congress on regulating things that even aren't commerce. I'm wondering if you think the argument you're making here is reconcilable with Lopez and Morrison and the commercial non-commercial distinction or whether you basically have to say that those cases were wrongly decided. Um, I think it's consistent with those cases because I think there the argument is there was no commerce in the first place. There was no buying and selling of anything in Lopez. There was no buying and selling of anything in Morrison. I am to think the cases um, are unfortunate cases. I'm not sure that they were wrongly decided. Um, that being said, uh, I think probably a better case in one way but not in another, and this was an example Randy gave, is Prince. Suppo I, I mean, that was actually a spending clause case, I think, restricted by the Tenth Amendment because it was, you had to receive LEAA funds in order for you to have to run the checks. But let's assume that it's just a straight up Commerce Clause case. If it were, then um, the argument there is not that there's nobody engaging in commerce. People were trying to buy guns. I think it's that the 10th Amendment put a constraint on. And so I do think that liberty constraints should be called liberty constraints and not uh, try to pretend that a particular liberty constraint is somehow uh, not a regulation of commerce. So to go back to like the example I gave earlier, if the government denies people the right to engage in a form of commerce that's necessary to their religion, that's a violation of the Free Exercise Clause. It's not that people who are buying religious articles are not uh, engaged in commerce. And I think the same thing is true here. People are buying uh, health care. And the question is whether they have a liberty interest in not being forced to buy it in a particular way or pay for it in a particular way. Go ahead. My name is Lauren McConnell, and um, I'm the Federal Society Vice President from the University of Idaho. Um, my question is really directed at Professor Barnett. Um, the, you mentioned early on that there was no factually similar case or issue, and I was wondering um, it, what, how you would distinguish um, the Fifth Congress of the U.S. passed an act for the relief of sick and disabled seamen. Um, and I'm wondering, is, that, is it simply the distinction that it's a limited market or a limited employment and that this one is so pervasive, or if you had a different limiting factor? 
Yeah, it, those, that law was about the regulation of navigation. Na regulation of navigation was considered, I think, uh, Justice Marshall correctly said in Gibbons versus Ogden that the regulation of navigation was at the core, actually, of the meaning of commerce. Uh, there's all kinds of original meaning evidence that that's true. Uh, and what this basically was a regulation that said if you are operating uh, a ship, a commercial ship, then you have to provide uh, for uh, insurance. Uh, for some of the people, or you have to provide for health care for some of the people that are sailors that are operate on your ship. This is a garden variety regulation of economic activity uh, in the sense that, uh, in, by garden variety, I mean it happens, we, we were, having, were having all kinds of uh, uh, panels on all the, the millions and billions of uh, economic regulations that say if you're going to do this, you have to do it this way. If you're going to do that, you ha if you're going to engage in this activity, you have to do it that way. And, and that's really uh, what that was. Um, th that case was, I think, or that example um, was actually uh, uh, misconstrued, I think, by the court in Southeast Underwriters when they found that insurance was commerce because they used this example of insurance as being regulated by commerce, Congress under the commerce power, but it wasn't. They were regulating uh, navigation, and this was simply a means of doing navigation. The court never said that the insurance part of that uh, was itself commerce. Um, uh, and so I think that Southeast Underwriters was actually wrong on whether insurance was commerce, but that's water under the bridge. That's a precedent. We're arguing this case uh, solely within existing precedent. We're not asking that the court restore the original meaning of commerce in this sense. So there's a light that's going directly in my eyes, so I totally cannot see anyone up there. But I'll wave blindly in case there is someone up there. There is indeed, so thank you. Um, my name is Stephanie Fleischer. I'm from William Mitchell College of Law in Minnesota. Uh, my question uh, references back to something Professor Barnett mentioned that I know has been brought up several times with this, that the, the regulations Congress has imposed here essentially make insurance companies almost a form of public utilities um, in, in line with gas companies, electric companies, because it would give Congress potentially the ability to regulate prices and things like that based on um, as Professor Carlin said, the, the benefit of, uh, the practical benefit in enforcing everyone to get insurance at a lower premiums. Um, with that being said, is there, is there a legitimate fear then that if insurance companies become like a public utilities commission, that the government can also control what type of procedures can be done in individual cases, the same as the government can now mandate or can now control which uh, utilities are, or which um, which companies are in charge of electricity versus gas versus which type of gas or coal and things like that? Um, well, I do think it's really important to know that what's going on here um, is that insurance is essentially being abolished as, ins as insurance. And this is in, in healthcare policy people are well aware of this and are in favor of this. So this is not something, and that is, insurance is a bet. I mean, life insurance is a bet. You're betting you're gonna die, the life insurance company's betting you're gonna live. And, you, and then there's, a, wage, there's, a, there's a, a risk that's been associated with that bet, and then that's how much your premiums are depending on what the risk that you present. I mean, a life insurance policy is I'll bet you a dollar a day to the day you die that you don't buy, die. That's what, that's what the life insurance company is offering you. Um, this has been, uh, this is the, the Affordable Care, there's been a lot of movement away from that anyway, but the Affordable Care Act just makes that illegal. Um, the Affordable Care Act says that you have to take everybody. The Affordable Care Act says that you can't vary the, the, uh, the amount you, you charge on the basis of actuarial risk. Uh, you can vary it somewhat, but not very much. Uh, so it's essentially outlawing traditional insurance um, and what, it, what it's preserving is the ability of insurance companies to make money. The whole point of this individual mandate is to keep insurance companies in business so that they can administer this government program. Um, and both because that would get them on board politically because they didn't want the administration didn't want the insurance companies opposing this, um, and, and it would allow for them to actually continue to exist, and they won't exist under this regime that the, gov that the government is now imposing on them. So they were, uh, were going to st still be able to make a lot of money because uh, this is a direct transfer from private citizens, from healthy citizens to the insurance companies, um, but it's not insurance anymore. Uh, and that might be the best policy. We might want to do away with health insurance because, you know, maybe that's not something that we're in favor of anymore. But we, we shouldn't make any bones or we shouldn't be under any illusions about what the nature of this change is. It's a pretty fundamental change. Um, and what really seems to conceal the fact is, is that money is going directly out of your pocket into the pocket of private companies rather than the traditional way, which is government exercises its tax power and then it distributes the money that it raises uh, itself and it has to be politically accountable for having done that. And just to follow up um, on a part of your question that I think Randy maybe didn't uh, address as much, which is the question of 
can the government regulate what procedures an insurance policy will provide, will pay for, and which ones it, it can't? The answer to that is yes, subject to the constraints of things like substantive due process, equal protection, the First Amendment, and the like. So just to take an example of a case I'm sure you're all familiar with, um, you know, another, another case involving Alberto Gonzalez, Gonzalez against Carhartt, right? The federal government used its Commerce Clause power to ban a particular second trimester abortion procedure. You read the act, and the act says it's anyone who in an affecting interstate commerce performs this procedure. Yes, the government can do that. The disagreement that I would have with Gonzalez against Carhartt is not that the government isn't regulating commerce there. It's that they're violating uh, substantive due process. And I think that's how uh, claims about whether something is uh, included or excluded from uh, insurance plans have to be argued, not on the grounds that it's about commerce, but on the grounds that there's some other constraint on Congress's ability to uh, enact those regulations. But the, amus the amusing thing about the Carhartt case was in oral argument, uh, Justice Stevens asked uh, uh, Paul Clement, who was defending the statute, uh, uh, what, what under the commerce power gives Congress the power to, uh, to tell free clinics uh, what they're supposed to do with respect to abortion? Um, and this was after the Rage case. And so uh, uh, Attorney General, uh, Solicitor General Clement was too polite to say to Justice Stevens in response, well, it was your opinion in the Rage case that <laughs> meant that this, this challenge would never be brought. Uh, but instead he said, well, the parties haven't raised it and we haven't briefed it. Well, that's the reason. However, this I mean, we did, we, we actually did file a brief in the case on behalf of the California Medical Association suggesting that there was a Commerce Clause problem with the and case. And that is you know, the final point I want yeah. to make. And that shows how the structural constraints on the federal government are themselves protections of liberty. And in fact, when the Constitution was first enacted, they were the only protections on liberty because there was no amendments and there was no due process clause. And it was sold to the people on the grounds that because Congress has only given limited enumerated powers, you don't even need a Bill of Rights. Well, that only makes sense if Congress does have limited enumerated powers. And, and once you define the power of Congress as the power, as Pam has said, to regulate, quote, the national economy and any means that are rationally related to the national economy, well, you have done away with that important first line of defense to protect liberty. And now all you have are the lifeboats that the anti-federalists insist be put on the Constitution, which is the Bill of Rights. So you're out of the structure designed by the framers themselves, and you're into the lifeboats. Well, I'm suggesting we don't want to just live in the lifeboats. We want to restore, we want to preserve what's left of the structure of the, uh, uh, of the Constitution that protects liberty. And this is a case that gives us op op the court the opportunity to say this far and no farther. Thank you. I think with that, we've run out of time, but I would uh, hope you'll join me in thanking the panelists for a really fantastic. Oh, yeah. Thank you.